If you, at a click of a button, you can order a car. If at a click of a button, you can order food. Why can't you at a click of a button order your salary today when you've worked already? So that's all we do. We're saying you've worked today, so get paid today. Make everyone a daily wage earner. And what you do with your finances is up to you. Welcome to episode seven of FinTech Founders. Gaurav and I are zooming in from the UAE, from Dubai and Sharjah respectively today. And it's a pleasure to host our dear friend, Omer Ansari, the co-founder and CEO of Abi. Uh, Omer, I think you're zooming in from Karachi. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I am indeed. Thanks a lot, guys, for having me on. Um, what we're hoping to do in the next 30 to 40 minutes is have a free-form conversation with Omer talking about a... Why did he set up Abi? Why did he leave his nice job in New York? B, what has it been like to be a founder, an early stage founder? And I'm sure Gaurav's gonna have some really good questions about product and business building, given his uh, background and experience. And I've got a few macro questions about Pakistan and FinTech as well. Um, and with that, let's kick off. So Omer, I set it up already. Uh, you had a nice job in New York. You traveled the world, some of the glamorous hotspots like, you know, Lagos and other places. You threw it all in to go to Karachi. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but why did you do that? Sorry, did my parents hack this call? Is that you through an avatar? We, we <laughs> consulted them before we came on. We have a list. You don't see thing. it. But I mean, come on, we can't there. have any... They see founders and not consult the parents, right? <laughs> we're, 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 all in the, we're all in the metaverse right now. I don't know. You could be my dad. I never, I never know. Uh, I'm not that old. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Listen, George Lucas is asking for his money back on uh, Star Wars, you know. Ronit is your father. <laughs> but seriously, come on, Omar, tell us. Come on. What happened? Oh, what wow. happened? What happened? I mean, yeah. It's, uh, it's a good question. Look, I, this the truth of it is I've always been the person who wants to take challenge and be the person on the other side of the table. Uh, what I mean by that is my career was investment banking, but always semi back and forth within the industry on the other, on, on flip sides of the table. So I'll start off as kind of a public market equity hedge fund manager or analyst, whatever you want to call it. And I always said, okay, I want to be the analyst on the other side of the table who's telling me what they think is actually happening in the markets, et cetera, for me to really get my hands. They're like, all right, so when the financial crisis hit, I was like, let me go and try that. Apparently it's the harder thing to do versus just sitting there and allocating money. So I went there and I, <laughs> I did it and I moved to Nigeria, I moved to uh, Kenya, South Africa, Dubai, I uh, really put my boots on the ground. That's one thing for me from a ethos perspective is if you're gonna do something, grasp it by like the horns and, and really go dig deep. Uh, and the only way to do that when you're doing emerging markets, the frontier is get your boots on the ground, get unknow the local culture because that's the only way you're gonna be able to understand what exactly is happening. Um, and so that was on that. Then after that, where I really fell in love with, I think FinTech was where we did our first transaction with Safaricom and M-Pesa. And I think what I tell everyone, and I feel like I'm repeating this, but I've, I've always been kind of a leftist wing person in a right wing world. So I was in investment banking, but always loved the idea of financial inclusion, which was never done by the banks. It was always, it, it ended up being done outside the banks, uh, which really struck a chord with me when we did it with Safari Palm and Bezos. I was like, hold on. This financial inclusion game, which everyone thought either NGOs will do it, which we know tend to be fairly lazy and nothing really happens, uh, or you are supposed to play it to the banks, but the banks are too busy doing other things which are more profitable, or at, at least they perceive, that this whole consumer gets forgotten about. And then suddenly you have a telco that steps in this place like, hold on a minute, we've got this figured out, boom, and, and they become larger than any bank within the country. Um, and so then I moved to the buy side again, where I get told, hey, yeah, you've been really good at telling us where we should be investing. How about you put your money where your mouth is? And I'm like, yeah, that's interesting. I've done it before, but this is a different angle and focusing only on FinTech and emerging markets. Uh, but then I hit a spot again where I said, I'm meeting all these FinTech founders. I mean, Gaurav I've known for a while and hugely admire what he's done in the past. And, uh, and, and meeting all these various kind of entrepreneurs that really went out and built something. 
Uh, and who am I? I'm just like sitting there and I have an idea and I've allocated money to you, but I really want it to be again on the other side of the table. The person's coming to me with ideas and saying, this is what I'm building. Be a builder. Uh, that's really what drove me to be able to do this. And so that was one part of the, the, the equation. I said, I want to be a builder. I want to put my operating hat on and really show that I can do this. It's a personal challenge for me. The second part of it, which I think is more important, is that I've had the privilege uh, of winning the genetic lottery, right? And what that means is I've had the privilege of living abroad. Uh, working with organizations and investing in various parts of the world in companies that have done this already. Ethnicity-wise, I'm from here. Now, if there's no other person better suited who has seen it, this playbook before, right? I've watched that movie. I've watched how that plays out. If I don't come back and do it, someone else probably will. Or if I don't do it, who will? So I said, you know what? That's what I decided is kind of midst of COVID, which is crazy. And maybe as part of the whole great resignation thing, but I uh, spoke to my wife and said, look, I, I think this is what I want to do. And uh, that's kind of the beginning of the end uh, where I decided let's move back and make things happen. Well, the end of the beginning. And, yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> hopefully not the beginning of the end. Um, yeah. <laughs> so you decide to, you decide to build um, yeah. You decide to go back to the, sort of the family roots in Pakistan, and you decide to build something called, which is now called Abi. Um, you know, we can call it a earned wage access company, a financial wellness company, or unpack a little bit for our audience listening to this live or on the podcast. Unpa unpack for us what is the core product, and what inspired you to say, right, this is the gap this is what we need to do in Pakistan. And this is what I've seen happen. You talked about your amazing kind of almost kaleidoscopic kind of experience in countries all over the world. How much did you sort of watch and learn and look and learn and you said, I can bring this back into Pakistan, this particular type of credit provision that's missing? Yeah. Um, when you think FinTech, I think the first, the first wedge of it is a, a binary choice between wallet first versus credit first. Um, and what I learned from the investment angle, uh, looking across these markets, specifically in places where there are already existing rails in place and large telcos, and then other wallet players, is going in and being another wallet provider was useless. Uh, you can come in and say, ah, it's, it's exciting and there's unbanked population. It's like, yeah, so what? And me as an average wallet user, I don't really care about that. People aren't wallet deprived in the country. They tend to be credit starved in the country, right? So for me, that was the first decision, a very clear decision of, that, that I've learned from other markets saying credit is really where people's loyalty lies. Uh, I'll give you a simple example. I was speaking to a few players before when I was wearing the Morgan Stanley hat coming in and, and trying to understand the market a little better. And some, uh, one wallet player said that they spent almost a uh, million dollars in one year, and that's a lot of money in Pakistan, uh, on, on marketing expenses when it came to trying to push retention on their platform when it came to their wallet. And what they did is they said, oh, we gave 20% you know, discount at Burger King. We gave 30% discount at uh, McDonald's, et cetera. Said what people did is they'd go to McDonald's, they download the app, and then they'd avail of the discount and then they delete the app. Never right? use it again. So never use it again. So what you've done is just wasted a bunch of VC money. You've done nothing when it comes to financial inclusion. You've just given me a, a cheaper Big Mac, right? That's that's really not what you want to be doing. That, that at least wasn't the thesis I wanted coming into this market. It's very easy to do and shows your numbers go very up, but it doesn't do anything. Um, so credit first is always the way because if you were my first form of credit, I build a loyalty and trust with you in a way that no other institution does. Uh, the example I give for that is uh, HSBC is one of the first banks I've ever banked with. They are still my bank to today. I don't regard them highly at all, but I still use them. <laughs> right? So that's, that's just inertia. It's just, Come on, that's just inertia. <laughs> it's just easy, right? It's just easy. Now, no. my point is that there's a, there's a bond that's been built between us because it's just easy for me to get things done along yeah. the way. Their ability to cross-sell me, by the way, becomes that much easier as well, 
right. right? So for me, it's the same way. When I'm your first form of credit and we trust each other, my ability yeah. to take you up the financial ladder becomes easier. So right. that was the premise of, of that, that. Now that bifurcates further. Now, what is that credit first product? As you alluded to, why salary advances? Uh, why this wedge? Mm -hmm. The next part of it is saying, what is a manual pain point that exists in the country that you can digitalize? Because coming in with a fancy product, which you think is going to help the masses, doesn't do anything. Because if they're not used to doing this already from a cultural perspective, their willingness to switch over to doing this on a digital platform is nil. As it is, it's still very uh, digital, despite whatever you read in terms of papers that come out saying COVID accelerated uh, digital adoption in EM or across the world. It did. However, 99% of transactions on a day-to-day -day basis still happening on a cash basis, right? I think, so, I think, Omer, I think, you know, what's, what's really, really, really amazing is if you just walk us through that customer experience, it'll explain the product a lot better for people that are listening. Take us through a yeah. typical person today, right? You, you've talked about concept and Ronit captured yeah. your concept really well. Walk us through the person that says, I've taken Abi, I'm using Abi. Who is that person and how are they using it and, and why? Just, just walk us through that yeah. bit. I want to see that, yeah. Yeah, so the, the pay cycle in Pakistan is between, if you're lucky, 35 days right. to up to 60 days, right? Now, there is no such thing as wage adjust inflation over here. It just doesn't exist. What that means is that people are constantly living paycheck to paycheck and their expenses are constantly going up and they don't have access to a savings pool or even access to interim financing because banking penetration is so low in the country. So what they do, what they did before Abi came along was they would go to their family and friends and ask for some money in between paychecks to be able to cover expenses. And then they pay them when the paycheck came in. Or they would go to their employer and say, hey, can you give me a salary advance? And then cut that from my paycheck when you, whenever you do decide to pay. And, and are we talking about drivers? Are we talking about teachers? Are we talking about everyone? Uh, what We're kind of segments so sweet, of people? So it's, it's interesting. We have everyone earning, so low point uh, in terms of salary on our platform is someone earning 15,000 rupees a month. We have people earning above 1.5 million rupees a month, right? So in real, in real money, we're talking about say 80 bucks to up to about say $8,000 a month. And see, that's, that's the interesting part, right? Did you expect that to happen from an adoption point of view? Did you see that coming? Because yeah. that's, that's this, see, this is where it's super interesting, right? Because the modeling and everything you took on the side of the table that you were sitting on before said the lower part of the market, the entry level of the market yeah. needs this hand to mouth scenario resolved, right? Exactly. But suddenly you're, you're telling us something else altogether, right? And, yeah. and how long has Abhi been live? How many months? Uh, seven months now. Right. In seven months, you're basically telling me your proposition is turning on its head, moving up the chain rapidly. Yeah. That's, 100%. see, that's, yeah. And, 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 and how often are they coming back? That's super interesting. So this is what's really interesting. When we started, the average transaction for active users, so uh, when we say active users, someone using it more than once a month. Um, and it started off with 1.2 times per, per user. It's now at 4.2. What does so, that mean? So that means they're using so that it four times four, a year? Or? Four, times, four, four times a month. They're taking loans from you as a salary advance four, four times. times a month? Four times. Four times a month. Whoa. Now, what's That's interesting the about that That's is the they're, not, they're yeah, not... Yeah, take us through that. So they're not taking out them. And so this is the other policy which everyone has about this product. When we're pushing this, for example, we go B2B2C, right? Uh, right? And when we go B2B2C, the business owner always pushes back. It's like, no, you know, if you do this, the reason why we don't provide it all the time is that everyone will constantly, you're just causing the problem to become worse because you're going to let them live paycheck to paycheck even further. What's been really interesting is that the average person is not availing of the 100% of the amount that's, a, that's available, right? They're doing a maximum of 20 to 25% of the available balance. So that's so, just frequency. It's not the whole salary amount they're taking. It's just no, the frequency they're pulling frequency. from exactly. interactions with you as a platform. Exactly. And the point is, there are different cycles that happen within the month that you cannot accommodate as a salary. So for example, your electricity bill comes in between the 
4th to the 28th. Your school kits fees are due between the 7th to the 15th. Your random other emergency medical thing, which is happening more and more now, given where COVID is, you do PCR test, whatever it may be, which costs about 6,000 to 8,000 rupees a month uh, per, per PCR test in Pakistan, that, that's happening more often. That happens any time of the month and you don't have that spare cash sitting around. So all these small things that are there that you typically didn't have cash at hand to be able to pay for, you now have access to that. Because the point is, if you work today, you deserve to be paid today. So this is one thing that I think everyone does gets wrong about this model. I was like, well, you're a payday. I was like, no, 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 we're not a payday because what we don't do is give you a salary advance. We're giving you earned wage access, which is like streaming your salaries. If you, at a click of a button, you can order a car. If at a click of a button, you can order food. Why can't you at a click of a button order your salary today when you've worked already? So that's all we do. We're saying you've worked today, so get paid today. Make everyone a daily wage earner. And what you do with your finances is up to you. How does the mechanics work? So walk us through it like a relationship. You go to a company, right? And what kind of size of company is it? How do you get the admin so that you get the wage deduction before they get paid? Just walk us yeah. through the mechanics because that'll help, I think, the audience understand as well that this is a relatively, nothing is risk-free, but this is a relatively low-risk yeah. way of doing credit. Yeah. So the <clears throat> reason why we do B2B to C in Pakistan is because uh, of two things. One, we want to control payback uh, because uh, there's no direct debit capability in the country. So for us, we need to make sure we get paid back and we go through HR, we're able to make sure we're deducting at payrolls. That's one aspect because otherwise B2C in the country has historic, very high NPL issues, up to 95%, for example, for some platforms. Uh, the second aspect of it is trust. Now, a lot of people who work for organizations, if a random company approaches them and gives them product, they don't tend to take it on. However, if your employer endorses the product, the more likely they're going to take on the product. And it helps both the organization and the employee. So what we do is we go in time with the company and say, hey, your entire employee base has access to us in four ways. They can access us through our own app. So we have a proprietary app, which is on iOS and Android. We have our two-way SMS service because despite the BS statistics of smartphone penetration that you read on any of the reports that are out there, real smartphone penetration is nowhere near as high as what people say it is in Pakistan. Even if they have a smartphone, for example, they use it as a feature phone because they can't afford the data. So we make sure that we give you a two-way SMS service so you can access it. Right. And the stats are probably do... distorted by you having three smartphones or something like that. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah. Um, and then the, the other aspect is if they have a smartphone, they have very limited data. So what they do use is WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. So we have a WhatsApp service. So you can contact us through WhatsApp and get uh, access to your salary then. And the other one is uh, IVR. So you can call in, it's an automated service. You speak in Urdu, tick, 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 boom, you get your money directly into your salaried account or wallet. So we go into any salaried account or wallet in Pakistan. If you don't have a wallet, we create one for you. If you don't have a salaried account, we create one for you. So, but that's rare. It does, it, the, most people have a wallet or a salaried account. Omer, two, two things quickly, just from a, from a 30,000 level view, you know, uh, of people who are, you know, getting to understand your business as much as possible on the whys and hows and, you know, believing in it as much as you do. The first question is, right, the obvious one. When people look at what you're doing, they go, oh, who cares? You know, a bank can do that. and All banks can do that. And, you know, so the first question is, uh, you know, why haven't the banks done it? And are they going to do it? And are they going to make any impact at all it's probably good for the whole ecosystem and there's never going to be a single player that will take a hundred percent of market so it's always great to have somebody else educated in the market i understand that but the first question is does that hold water you know that the banks are going to come and do it or can they do it or why haven't they done it just walk us through that the second part is which is the more more even more interesting part is the product roadmap that you had in mind versus the product roadmap you're going at right now can you manage the pace at which the market clearly is screaming at you for, for demand uh, versus your ability to sort of react and build at the pace you can in, you know, startup zone? So those are the two questions. If, you know, it'd be great to have that visibility. Yeah. Um, on the first, when it comes to banks, what's been really interesting is the banks want to work with us. 
uh, they've realized the ability to do this themselves is not there. Uh, I'll give nice. you, I won't, name, I won't name the name, but we sat in a meeting with one of the banks, one of the largest banks over here, and we got approached by the digital team and then the CEO and chairman of the group to come in and say, hey, let's work together on this and let's nice. uh, track this so it works. Uh, and then when we finally got to the technical meeting and the technical head stepped in the meeting, he said, oh, he stood up and he said, we can do this ourselves. Why should we work with these guys? That's when the chairman, oh, really? stood, up and, that's when the chairman stood up and said, why do you shut up and sit down? Because what I asked you to do two years ago hasn't been delivered yet. So yep. these guys have done what they said they were going to do in four months and they're ready in their in market. So still I think a big that problem was, here. Uh, still a big problem here. But yeah, I feel you. Yeah. So, so the banks are actually working with us. I don't regard, and this is one thing which we make sure we do from the get go. And, I, and I'm very vocal about this as well, is we're not, we don't have the ambition to be a neobank. We don't, everyone, I think it's a buzzword of, of, of 2021, <laughs> right? Everyone wants to be a neobank. Now, you could have piss off banks if you're going to go and do that. Like, why would you do that? Like, you're never going to have a better cost of funding versus the banks. So work with the banks. So that's kind of how we've approached it. And that's why the banks have been a lot more friendly with us comparatively to some of the other neobanks who aren't neobanks, right? So that, that's, that's the, on the banking side of things. Um, on your second question, when it comes to the demand in the market and us keeping up, uh, the simple answer is, is, is no. Uh, it, it's, it's taken us by storm. I'll give you a simple example. I'd raised $2 million in our seed round. And my idea with that was to use one and a half million dollars of that for our book, uh, because I knew I needed to prove the model through equity in this market, yeah. because the banks aren't going to do it from day one. And have to build the data tracks. Down, exactly. Prove, basically prove the concept. Uh, right. Have a track record and then be able to go out and, and right. build the book through the banks. Um, and use 500,000 for OPEX CapEx. I thought that would last me. We went live in July. I thought that book would be able to cover me till about Feb of this year. Um, we surpassed that in September. Uh, so we ended up having to raise another five and a half million dollars, which again, I thought would last me till March of this year. We've done with five, so with a balance sheet strength of about five and a half to six million dollars in December, we did ten point five million dollars worth of transactions. You're doing so, an eighty twenty, right? You're doing an eighty twenty on your book and yeah. your tech and team, right? That's exactly. that's where you're flying. Yeah, okay. So, so we just things are flying when it comes to a demand perspective. Our product side, there's a, a plethora of areas we want to add on to as well. We're working on that. But the idea is that this in itself is really taking off. So uh, I, there's, there's, there's always, and I think that's one thing is, is, is the hard part in FinTech. When you're opening up Pandora's box, because then you go and they're like, there's always someone who wants credit. There's always a different form of credit they want and a different product. You just need to make sure that whatever new product you're going into has as big an opportunity as what you already have as well, if not bigger, because otherwise, you're creating these random side products and then you ended up, you look at the end of the year of your portfolio and you have like 25 different products. You're like, but none of them are really doing much. So we're just being very careful about what we're going into next. Um, but there's a lot of demand for what we want to do and we're building out as we go along. Thanks a ton for that. I'm going to hand back to, to Ronit to, to catch the last good bits of the session before our time runs out. Thanks a lot, Omar. Just maybe to extend uh, two of the points you mentioned there, Omer, is um, the first one is on the on the banks. Um, what, whether it's in Pakistan or this model that you're operating, obviously you've seen operate in lots of other countries, mainly emerging markets, I think. Maybe you've seen them in developed markets as well, or so-called developed markets. I'd love to hear thoughts on that, but what stopped the banks from doing? Is this a generic that whether you're in Pakistan or Egypt or maybe even the UAE, you want to deal with, I don't know, corporates or big ticket transactions. And is it a business model issue? Is it a tech issue that they just don't have the tech ready? Is it a cultural issue? Why haven't the banks been more into this space? Because it's clearly a demand. Credit, uh, we've, we've all seen the stats. Credit is very low in, as a percentage of GDP in, um, in Pakistan. And particularly personal or you know, consumer or whatever household credit is very low. Well, why have the banks not been able to fix it? And my second point was 
more of a specific Abi balance sheet to the extent that you can share. You mentioned the number of transactions you're doing. How are you, I mean, is it just the velocity of transactions? How are you funding that? Because based on the equity, because equity finance so far, it doesn't seem enough to finance. So I, I guess the velocity is very high. So I'd love to hear about that. And where can you, because obviously equity is expensive, even though equity capital is more freely available than in the past and valuations are founder friendly, let's say, if they're good founders, but it's still expensive capital compared to debt historically. And is yeah. there, how, how, when can you transition more into a sort of debt funded model rather than an equity funded model? Yeah. Um, so on the last question, when it comes to um, uh, the debt lines, the banks we're working with, we should hopefully have a couple of term sheets in place within the next few okay. weeks. Uh, so that's that's one thing which we're, really like, which we're really pushing on. So uh, we're in final stages with a couple of the large banks over here. So okay. so that hopefully comes through uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, and so that's, keep that's, an eye out for that. And if you listen to this yeah. on the podcast, this is being recorded on the sixth of January. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> So we should have hopefully something over there. Uh, in terms of the book, well, the velocity, as you said, is very high. So average tenure is 12.3 days. So that allows us to churn uh, the book numerous times during the 12, month. 12, me, 12 days. 12.3 12 days, yeah. Okay. So it allows me to churn uh, multiple times during the month. The velocity. Uh, so that allows me to double my book, right? That's why with a five and a half to $6 million balance sheet, I'm able to do $10.5 million worth of TPV uh, in yeah. one month. Um, so that's essentially on that leg. Um, on your first question, sorry, my, I'm esca escaping me. Um, the banks. Um, yeah, why can't they do this themselves? Yeah. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a question of, it's actually an uh, inventor's dilemma, right? Yeah. Um, and what it is, is a mix of inventor's dilemma and culture. Right. You don't want to kill the golden goose. Uh, so you as a bank, you have a traditional consumer banking unit, and then you have your digital banking unit. Right. Now, for now, your consumer banking unit is killing it comparatively to your digital banking unit, yeah. even though the digital banking unit has more potential. Sure. So you as an, as an entity have to make a decision, am I gonna kill my golden goose for a five-year view? Mm. Uh, or do I try and make them work together, which never happens. Like we dealing with, I've yeah. when we deal with the banks, for example, I've dealt with the consumer units, I've dealt with yeah. digital banking units, yeah. and they never get along. What, what and so this stalls. What's, what's, and so this stalls everything. So legacy infrastructure, which is there, and this is where inventor dilemma comes in. Legacy infrastructure does not allow for decision making process to happen fast enough for them to compete with me. Yes. And historically, yes. historically, it was a question of us doing this. But I think what's happened is luckily places like China, Indonesia, and now Egypt, for example, and the US have laid the groundwork of how it is for banks to work with fintechs and no longer be at loggerheads. Yeah, cooperation is a real thing. Exactly. So it's competitive advantage, right? Basic economics. I'm good at what I do with, with a small team and I'm, I'm able to go around and, and, and basically <laughs> cause transactions happen much faster than you are and you're very good at balance sheet and you're very good at, at at being able to allow me to access certain realms of your book that you haven't been able to access before so let's work together as opposed to fighting each other and and so i think it's that's really what's really uh, allowed us to do it and also why the banks haven't been able to do it before you're not digital first yeah they're not digitally native at no. all. And the, the innovator's dilemma point you mentioned, there's a lot of speed of decision making, I think are two crucial ones. It's almost like yeah. at the top level, they know what's coming down the pipe, but uh, yeah. they simply can't change their behavior. It's like, I guess it's a bit like me and Gara of eating too much in December, or at least me eating too much. We know what's coming down the <laughs> uh, Can't resist. Well, it's, um, it's like our parents' generation when it comes to like television versus Netflix, right? Right. Uh, is they still want cable TV, no matter what. They say, you want cable TV. Like, but you don't need cable anymore. No, no, yep. no, I need, I, need, I need my cable yeah. TV. So Cut you need that dish. Yeah. So it's the same thing when it comes to, I think when it comes to digital FinTech bank yeah. and, and, and being dig digitally native yeah. versus having legacy thought process infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. 
I think we've got another five minutes or so, Gaurav, and I've got a couple more questions I'd love to ask Omer. I don't know if you've got any final questions from your side, Gaurav, on product or team yeah, or business I mean, building. Absolutely. I mean, I'd, I'd love to shoot one, one final question in. If we've got more time, that's great. Yeah. I mean, uh, Omer, from where you're sitting right now and the, the pace at which you're growing, Pakistan seems to be on course for what it's doing, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, does it seem too far-fetched that you break geographical boundaries with what you've built here and say, there's a, there's a very similar neighbor nearby that you will set up parallel operations with? Or is it just something where you're just so stretched thin with so much demand in Pakistan where you're gonna sit there and say, listen, Let's not let's not get too greedy with you know our eyes and actually just own the market where we are. Um, yeah. So that's one question. And are you seeing copycats coming up, or are you seeing similar businesses where you will compete with them in other geographies? That's it's going to be a conundrum, right? So I'm I'm curious. Step one and step two, if you could take us through that part, that's interesting as well. Yeah. Um, so, Pakistan, we've only scratched the surface. Uh, with this one product alone, let's put it in numbers terms. So 55 to 60 million people in the labor market in Pakistan, right? Earning 150 bucks a month on average. That's about a seven to $8 billion uh, monthly payroll market. That means if I get 1% market share of that, I need to be doing transaction value of close to 70 to $80 million, right? Uh, a month. A month, a month. I'm only doing 10. So that's for 1% market share. Now, even if we say that number is BS, it's actually half of that. I still will be doing 35 to $40 million worth of transactions a month. So I haven't even I haven't touched, touched that yet for this one product, let alone anything else I can go into. And at 1%. At 1%. Right. So, so for me, I've only scratched the surface when it comes to Pakistan. And so I don't necessarily need to go to any other market. Do I have ambition to go to other markets? Yes, I do. Uh, if there was any other market I would love to go into, I'm not saying it happens tomorrow, is Bangladesh. Uh, my whole view is I like going where no one else has gone nice. yet. Uh, and so that's where I think Bangladesh is still very interesting. It reminds me of Pakistan probably two years ago or three years ago uh, when I first started looking at Pakistan, where it, was, it has all the right story me mechanics to it as what Pakistan does, but the lack of foreign attention quite yet for you to be able to go and really build for that when it when their foreign attention comes on. Because that's really what's happened to Pakistan in the last year. It's been foreign attention that's basically opened up like, oh, there's this place which is very similar to Indonesia. Uh, it just popped up out of nowhere. I don't know. It's, it's a cool place. 100%. Pakistan. Same as Africa. Um, yeah, it's crazy. So 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 for me, I want to be there before anyone wakes up to Bangladesh. And so that'd be another market I would love to go into. Cool, thank you, man. Ronit, back to you, brother. Uh, without front running the Bangladeshi expansion plans too much, um, let's sort of talk <laughs> more macro than I'll be specific. What is it uh, for the audience who are listening in uh, live or on podcast, what is it that um, maybe don't know Bangladesh so well, what is it about Pakistan that attracted you beyond sort of family roots that you saw was really interesting a couple of years ago and what is it about Bangladesh today that's similarly interesting is it the is it a big credit gap a big underserved population uh, when it comes to finance we know that but that digital point about digital enablement are we seeing sort of a similar pickup like we've seen in Indonesia and India you know growth in digital connectivity what are the catalysts sort of to draw people in in the next two three years beyond just you know, some Bangladeshi kid dropping out of Stanford and pitching up in some West Coast VC firm. Yeah. Which is often the catalyst, but let's leave that aside. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, look, Bangladesh uh, for me is, as you said, similar to Pakistan. Uh, in fact, it's actually slightly ahead. Uh, so very broad metrics. So G per capita actually is higher. Uh, mm -hmm. smartphone penetration there is actually a real smartphone penetration, by the way, is high right. over there. Digital yeah. adoption is actually high. So you look at Bcash, for example, yeah. in the country, yeah. it's very similar to M-Pesa, right? Yeah. So Bcash has been around for a very long time, is mm -hmm. actively used by the average person and mm -hmm. is gone into other forms of credit, which Easy Pesa has not been able to do in Pakistan, by the way. 
So why is, that? Why is Bcash they, done more than an easy post though? They didn't focus on that. They did a lot more on the wallet side. They also were a lot more other wallet players. So you have Jazz okay. Cash, you have Easy Pass, right. plus all the smaller guys who were there. So people were fighting the wallet game oh, okay. as opposed to okay. the credit. And then when they tried to go to credit, it caused problems and the APRs mm -hmm. were too high, et cetera, et cetera. It just ended up being a mess. Um, in Bangladesh, though, Bcash is really the dominant player. Yeah. It's like, like it's, an, it's, it's like financial. It, it's been by a mile, by ten miles. Yeah. It's it's, uh, it's ahead of competition. So, for me, they are more digitally native compared to the average Pakistani. So, for mm -hmm. my ability to convert to digital is that much easier. But the product which I'm talking about is not 100 percent there yet. Uh, so, and, and other forms of it as well, which I would love to go into, are not there yet. So my ability to convert becomes that much easier. So if I can go into the right kind of balance sheet, that right. allows me to just automatically play that that kind of hockey stick. Right, right, right. Got it. Well, we're watching with interest what happens um, both for you and others in Bangladesh in the next few years. Maybe one final question before we wrap up, and this is more of a, a personal kind of founder journey question. Um, clearly things seem to be touch wood going well, um, but roll back, to the, let's scroll back to before you actually, you know, it's a, a plan on a napkin or a spreadsheet or whatever it was. And then actually the rubber hitting the road, you being there, building the business in person, what's been the biggest, the biggest surprise or the biggest, blimey, if I knew this, before I started, maybe I wouldn't have done it, or maybe I'd have done it, but even with more enthusiasm. What's been the biggest sort of gap, surprise between planning and dreams and reality and actually building? Uh, people management. <laughs> There's 50 people. <laughs> Come on, you're a tough company. What's all this about people management? <laughs> it's, uh, oh. it's, 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 it's the it's, people. It's, it's a slow fire. It's, it's, it's a tough game. It's a tough game. Right. Uh, so you have to take in, sorry, there's construction happening, um, yeah. but there's, uh, it's a tough gig when it comes to people management and we're not 28 people. Mm. Uh, and I'm used to being in front of, uh, even in the South there's you, even when you're managing those 28 people, it was very much a very binary decision that you have to really make on anything mm. over here. Nothing's binary and there's a lot of gray area. And, there's always a backstop as well when it comes to that decision, whether if something goes wrong or not. Over here, the buck stops at you. So what you have to decide does have a lot of impact on anything that happens. Um, so, so yeah, that part of it definitely was, was something I didn't anticipate. Um, the part, so I read the book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. Yes. Uh, and I'll tell you one thing that none of these books will ever prepare you for what you actually end up doing. Uh, and so despite you reading it, you're like, it doesn't, it doesn't register. And then you're going through, you're like, holy shit. Yeah. It's, uh, it's experience, my friend, like, you can't yeah, substitute and you can't substitute it oh, for man. a book. Exactly. You, you just got nothing like, prepares you. Sleep, the, it's constantly yep. on your mind. You're watching TV. It's not registering. This will probably completely, I probably, I'm probably like in blur right now. I probably don't even know what's happening right now. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's one of those things. Like it's a, it's, it's a foot adrenaline rush and I, I'm really happy I did it, but mm. it's, 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 it's full on. It's, it's better than more than, more than anyone or anything you can read that could, could prep you for it. Right. You know, right. It reminds me, Ron, of the, uh... You know, mm -hmm. I, I manage about 50 people, right? And it's yeah. unbelievable, plus other things. But it, yeah. it's, it's I, I, I feel what he's saying, but mm. what, one person I have mass respect for in this region, again, uh, Omer, to your story of starting something from scratch, you know, is, uh, is Mudassa. Because yeah. if, if you spoke, if you went into any random Kareem mm. till date, he's yeah. met them personally, right? And you see the size of that company and that is an unbelievable job. So I think one thing that anyone that's listening to this or, or watching this, right? Uh, people management, if you have that down, mm. kudos to you, you'll, 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 you'll manage other obstacles just as well. So yeah, hats off, best of luck. <laughs> and with that, that's all we got time for. So thank you so much, Omer, for joining Gaurav and myself for 
episode, whatever it was, I think it was episode six of the FinTech yep. Founders series. Um, if you're listening <laughs> to this on podcast, remember, register, sign up, share, spread the love. Um, and um, we'll be back in a couple of weeks with our next guest. So thank you so much for joining us today, Omar. Thanks, Omar. Pleasure. Thanks, and guys. And we look forward to watching and sharing in their journey in the months and years ahead. Thank Big you. love. Take care. Take care, guys.